All right, welcome. Um, I'd like to take a moment to thank all of the many people who've helped to make this evening possible. Our first thanks go to the Hendricks Murphy Foundation, whose generosity has supported this visit. Um, at Hendricks Murphy, as usual, Henrietta Vanneman, Sarah Engler Young, and Hope Coulter have yet again worked their magic. Um, thanks are also due to Ty Jager, Ann Goldberg, Claire Zarker, and Marie Cresson, who led the community in a discussion of Dr. Cott's work earlier in the week and to the many others who have supported this visit in ways big and small. I came to Edwige Danticott's work late, later than my colleagues in creative writing and contemporary fiction, who had been following her for years, it had seemed. And this is perhaps an ironic thing in that so many of the accolades that Edwige Danticott has won have been, in essence, an expression that she is early Harper's Bazaar hailed her as one of 20 people in her 20s who will make a difference, while the New York Times Magazine ranked her among a list of 30 under 30 creative people to watch. Perhaps these mismatched timings mirror how Danticott's work draws the past into the present in ways that are always unsettled, that resist our attempts to make our differing realities neatly align even as they honor our real and fundamental need to try to do so. Maybe nowhere is this sense of how the worlds we have and will experience come together so evident as in Danticat's writing about her experiences as an immigrant writer, one who takes up the imperative to create dangerously, as she puts it, so that those who read and see and listen to the artist's work might find themselves in a world that both is and is not their own. Take, for instance, her recent insistence in an, in an interview that the life of an immigrant is itself an act of creation. Responding to Patricia Engel's description of the immigrant's life as, quote, art in its purest form, Danticott argues that recreating yourself this way, recreating your entire life, is a form of reinvention on par with the greatest works of literature. The mothers and fathers who arrive in a place wholly unknown and build day by day new lives and new communities participate in work that, as Danticott puts it, quote, requires everything great art requires, risk-taking, hope, a great deal of imagination, all the qualities that are the building blocks of art. In Danticott's words, they become artistic mentors, modeling the discipline and resourcefulness and self-sacrifice that the immigrant writer will need to survive. And from this perspective, we can see with Danticat that art belongs, as she puts it, in the realm of what ordinary people do in order to survive. And in the work of surviving and of flourishing in a world that does not always have time and space for all of us. We are fortunate, though, to have time and space here to hear Edwige Danticott's voice and to listen as she speaks to us. Please join me in welcoming Edwige Danticott. Good evening. Well, that was a wonderful start, bumping the mic off the <laughs> introducer's hand. Um, thank you so much, um, Tony Jordan, for that wonderful and very kind introduction. Um, I would like to thank um, President Tetsuyi, um, the Hendricks Murphy Foundation, Ho Hope Coulter, um, and Henrietta, and everybody who has been so kind um, in welcoming me during this, um, this visit. It's really wonderful um, to be here. It took me a couple of planes from Miami, but I'm very, <laughs> but I'm very happy um, to be here. So what I'll do, uh, I'll uh, talk and, and then read a little bit of, of an excerpt. Um, and then afterwards, I'll, it will be my favorite part, which is when um, we get to have a conversation and I get to uh, take your questions. Um, so, thank you again uh, for coming. Uh, Create Dangerously, the Immigrant Artist 
at work. Um, this talk, like the book it's um, named after, is an ongoing explanation, exploration for me of being an artist and an immigrant looking both at the present and the past and at how people sometimes ver under very difficult circumstances come to and come through their art. So I'm inviting you to go on a journey together with me um, through, through the past, through my past and, and, um, and some of the, the people and the words that have inspired me um, to come to my own um, creations. So um, in the beginning was the word, and perhaps the first words ever uttered um, were once upon a time, il était une fois, or even um, as in the introduction to Haitian stories, creak, crack, which a gentleman greeted me with this evening, and I was just kind of startled. I thought, hey, how do you know that? And then, I, then I remembered the book. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so please allow me um, to begin by telling you a true but sad story. Uh, on November 12, 1964, in Port-au-Prince, the capital of Haiti, a huge crowd gathered to watch an execution. The president of Haiti was then the dictator, François Papadoc Duvalier, and on the day of the execution, he had ordered that government offices and schools be closed, and principals were commanded to bring their children to watch. People living in the provinces outside of the capital were also bussed in to fill the crowd. The two men to be executed were two young men, Marcel Numa and Louis Douin. Marcel Numa was 21 years old and the son of a coffee planter in a southern Haitian town called Jérémy, which is a place in Haiti that we call the city of poets because per capita, it has produced the most Haitian poets. Uh, Louis Douin, the second man to be executed, was 31 years old and he was also from Jérémy. He had served in the US Army, and the two of them had been friends since childhood when after another massacre that was in Jamie that was ordered by Papa Doc, their families had moved to Queens, New York. And in Queens, the two men joined a group called Jeune Haiti, or Young Haiti, and became two of 13 Haitian American youth who left the US in early 1964 to engage in a guerrilla war against the dictatorship. They spent three months in the hills and mountains of Haiti and eventually most of those young men died in battle, except Marcel Numa and Louis Douin, who were captured. And after months of chasing them down, Papa Doug Duvalier wanted to make a spectacle of their deaths. So on the morning of November 12, 1964, the firing squad did its brutal work. Blood was splattered onto a wall, the collaborative art of dictators and their henchmen, and the two men were forever silenced, or were they? My friend, the photojournalist Daniel Morel, who's one of Haiti's most um, famous photo photojournalists, was there the day of the execution. And he says, all these many years later, that that day ended up making him a photojournalist. He, like one of those children, well, many of those children, was taken out of school. And after the execution, he walked up to one of the men's corpses and took out his glasses and tried to see uh, through the blood-stained glasses. And the next day, his father had a bakery in town, and all over town in movie theaters, they replayed the execution, and they had photos. And Danielle looked at those images, and he says, I want to do images like that, but I will use them for good. And in that moment, made him uh, a photojournalist. And he ended up being one of Haiti's most um, fervent chronicler of its life, of its political difficulties. So most writers, artists, have their own creation stories, like Daniel, stories they can pinpoint to in explaining how they came to their art. Uh, the French Algerian writer Albert Camus, from whom I borrow the title, Create Dangerously, from an essay uh, that he would call L'artiste et son temps, the artist in his time, had said that just like a person's life, an artist's life is nothing but a slow trek to discover through the detours of art these three of two images in whose presence his heart first opened. So Danielle's creation story as a photojournalist is in that execution, something that happened 50 years ago when he was much younger than many of you here affects his life's calling and what he is doing today. This execution has also felt present for me even though it happened before I was born in part because Marcel Numa 
and Louis Dwan were children of migration. They were young migrants who had returned from a place where I was living in New York to try to save the homeland, manifesting and carrying out what people still do today. A lot of people who have left, whether they're doctors or have some other profession, who have that yearning to go back and rebuild the homeland for the exact same reason that they ended up uh, leaving it. And so what is the, the act of creation in that moment? What is sometimes the present demand of artists who are engaged, who want to engage um, in the culture? This has always been uh, a debate from, from times past. And one of the things that Camus asks in, his, um, in this lecture that has the same title as this book, he says, on the deck of slave galleys, is it possible to sing of the constellations while the convicts bend over the oars and exhaust themselves in the hold? Is it possible, he asks, to record the social conversation that takes place on the benches of the empty theater while the lion is crushing the victim? Yet this is what a lot of artists are forced to do. Some do it from a distance, and some do it from the Colosseum, and some do it inside the jaws of the lion um, itself. Wolishienka, the Nigerian Nobel laureate, spent months in jail in his native Nigeria, and he has written that writing in certain environments carries with it occupational risk. When he was in prison without trial, he was uh, put in prison, uh, he was accused of treason because he would take certain positions as a citizen, and what he, only weapon he had, the only uh, weapon any writer has are tools, the pen and paper, and that was taken away from him, and he was put in solitary confinement for 22 out of the 27 months that he was there. So in order to break the, the barriers to communicate, he would write on toilet paper, cigarette paper, he would write poems on the wall and memorize them, and then erase them, pass messages outside between the, the, between the, the cells, and that's, what, that's how he was able to continue his dangerous creation, to not give up the craft, which was, he also considers his weapon. Books in all forms of writing, he wrote, are terror to those who wish to suppress the truth. And the truth is not only suppressed in totalitarian regimes or in the past or, or in, in distant countries we're told are really uh, scary. Books are banned all the time in this country and we have banned book um, to combat that, but it should always be banned book, banned day, banned month, banned ban year, so that we remind the people who are banning the books that, that this is not something that um, is done in a free society. Uh, this year, for example, the Board of Education uh, president in the home state of uh, Nobel laureate Toni Morrison called her first novel, The Bluest Eye, pornographic, and asked that it be banned from classrooms and last February, the Kansas Senate passed a, a bill allowing teachers to be arrested for distributing material that they deem pornographic, including uh, this novel. So even in societies of relative openness, we find uh, against certain uh, infractions, like being told what, what books we read, because we need to know that art should be created and consumed in impossible circumstances. We need to know that no matter what words, no matter what, words can still be spoken and written, that songs could still be sung, that pictures could be drawn, that stories could be told, that our voices can't be um, silenced. But suppression can, of truth can also happen in different ways. Recently, in the news, we had the, the story of the McGraw-Hill uh, World Geography textbook in the section that described uh, slavery as immigration, basically where, where the, the, the caption read, the Atlantic slave trade between 1500 and 1800 brought millions of workers from Africa to the southern United States to work on agricultural plantations. And um, so it's, it's crucial in moments like that that we challenge some um, apparent truth. Imagine like a, a, a middle school child um, hearing this, that, that Workers. It's a kind of erasure that wipes out an entire and pay painful um, segment of history in, a, in the struggle of a whole group of people. So dangerous creators, as well as the, the dictators or the people who would suppress their silence, realize that the language, the power of language. Language has a lot of power. It has revisionist power. And with one word like this saying, you know, workers as opposed uh, to slaves, 
can wipe out the whole, the whole hours, horrors of, of slavery and make slavery seem voluntary. You know, the slave trade was not immigration. Um, and, and if you minimize that, then you can minimize even what is happening um, in this country uh, today. So how do we move the world when all else seems to be against it? Can language, images, words change conditions, uh, situation that seems impossible? This is what uh, these artists who are the, my, my model artists, artists like Daniel Moyel, this is the question that we are asking ourselves all the time. And how far do we have to go? Uh, does it take the image of a young dead boy lying on a beach, for example, to make us aware that thousands of people have been dying in the Mediterranean Sea for 18 months? Uh, does it take a video of a policeman shooting a 12-year-old boy seconds after arriving on a scene to realize that there's a problem with police murdering black and brown men, women, and children in this country? A young girl being wrestled in a classroom by an officer twice her size to, to produce that there are very few places where black children, uh, black and brown children are safe. Does it take political provocation from an aspiring politician in our reality show era to show us how much immigrants are despised in some quarters in this country? How some folks want the labor, the work, but not the people, and on and on. So what does the artist do to move the world? We start by some version of bearing witness. And not everyone is comfortable with the term bearing witness, but no matter what term we use, it's, it means to me being, as Henry James said, one of those people on whom nothing is lost. Um, one of the, for me, favorite conversations I've seen the, the writer activist uh, James Baldwin have is, uh, was in the New York Times with Julius um, Lester in 1984. And, and Lester, uh, Julius Lester asks um, James Baldwin a little bit combatively, you know, sort of challenging. He says, witness is a word that I've heard you use to describe yourself. What are you a witness to? And Baldwin had an answer that I liked very much. And he said, you know, in the simplest terms, witness means witness to whence I came, witness to where I am, witness to what I've seen, and the possibilities that I think I see. And nothing is much better than talking about the possibilities, marrying possibility with and witness, than when you're in front of a group of very young people who are in, the, in college at a time where you're discovering all the power um, of all these things, um, of possibility, of, of, of having witness and not being um, complacent and uh, in the face of, of, of injustices. So the artist and the conscious person who moves the world um, is a witness and is a seeing witness. Um, Albert Camus said again um, in one of his last lectures that art cannot be a monologue. And art cannot be a monologue. That's why, the per that's why the, we can sing, we can talk about both the constellation that was, is happening in the oars, and that's what we can talk about, both the lion and the victim that's being crushed um, in the Colosseum. And it is what a lot of um, artists do in a completely ahistorical conversation that I often imagine my two, the two idols of my writing life, Albert Camus and Toni Morrison, um, having. I imagine Toni Morrison answering him about, um, can, you, can you sing of the constellation in, the, in the, the slave hold? And I imagine her answer to be the part of her Nobel lecture when she says, tell us what it is to be a woman so that we may know what it is to be a man, what moves at the margin, what it is to have no home in this place, to be set adrift from the one you know, what it is to live at the edge of towns that cannot bear your company. Tell, about, uh, tell us about ships turns away from shorelines. Tell us about a wagon load of slaves, how they sang so softly that their breath was indistinguishable from the falling slow. How they knew from the hunch of the nearest shoulder that the next step will be their last, that the next stop would be their last. So I wish I had a picture of this. I hadn't thought of it ahead. But this past June, I saw uh, Jacob Lawrence's migration series at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. I don't know if some of you have seen it on postcards, and, but it's definitely worth, you have homework, so go Google it when you go, when you go home. And, and I had seen these many paintings before in books and magazines 
but never in person. And there are these beautiful uh, shadowy images of the, the great migration uh, of African Americans from south to north over um, most of the century. And um, Lawrence showed us in what could be images of migration, of what we are seeing on the news today in Europe, of all the, these refugees who are trying to cross these borders, who are walking, who are taking, who are dying on the boats, who are dying um, in trucks, who are, are just trying to, to get somewhere else. His crowd of um, African Americans jammed into train stations headed for Chicago, New York, and St. Louis could have been the crowd of Syrians packed into train stations in Budapest just a few weeks ago. The migrants kept coming, that he wrote under the, the painting. And when we look at his work and we think of all these other connections, the migrants keep coming, it seems, from different centers and at different parts of the world. And that same week when I went to see uh, the, the Lawrence ex uh, exhibit in New York, it was the same week that nine men and women had just been brutally assassinated by a, a young man in, in Charleston, South Carolina. And the possibility that 200,000 Haitians and Dominican uh, of Haitian descent could be expelled from the Dominican Republic. So that work was calling out to me. And the way that that work calls out to you is that connects us throughout, uh, throughout the ages. And that's the power of art, whether it uh, really engage art, whether it engages out less politically, whether it engages our soul, is that that work can connect all of us through the ages. And people who feel like they have nothing in common, no connections at all, can see in that piece of art things that, that, are, that will happen to others in a way that we had not um, foreseen. Uh, Toni Morrison says all the time that um, Tolstoy did not know that he was writing for her a 14-year-old colored girl in Lorain, Ohio. And she certainly didn't know that she was um, writing for me, uh, a 14-year-old Haitian girl in Brooklyn, New York. <laughs> uh, my, my friend, uh, the Haitian writer, Danny Laferriere, who was a, a, a journalist doing the Duvalier regime and, and ended up leaving Haiti um, at the time of, of Numaï and Dwayne and the, this execution, um, wrote a book called Je suis un écrivain japonais. Says, I am a Japanese writer. And so he would say, you know, people are always asking me, are you a Haitian writer or are you a, a, a Canadian writer because he lives in Canada? And he straight out comes and says, oh, I'm a Japanese writer. And they said, how's that? And he says, well, uh, when, I, when a Japanese reader reads me, I become a Japanese writer. And so, um, and that's the other thing also that is um, part of creating uh, dangerously. And it's, it's less the danger part, but the danger of, of forcing, of demanding an intimacy with a reader you may never know, with a reader you may never meet, not just inhabiting your creation, but also uh, becoming that reader, becoming that person. Um, Jacob Lawrence did not know that he was painting for uh, a situation that would represent so closely what was, was happening in Syria in this century. He was writing about his space and time, his very specific and particular circumstance, but the way that humanity works, and sometimes we forget that as humans ourselves, is that there are things that connect us, there are things that repeat, there are cyclical things that art captures um, more than um, anything else uh, in certain circumstances. And that's why great art supersedes this moment in time. It's um, transcendent, and storytelling works in very much uh, the same way. Uh, we tell ourselves stories in order to live, Joan Didion famously said, and perhaps we tell each other uh, stories for the same reason. Uh, a story is much bigger always than the person it, who tells it, and that's why our stories outlive our authors, and that's why powerful stories can be considered um, dangerous. Most of the dictators in our, and that's why Marquez is so brilliant at this, most of the dictators in our region always consider themselves poets. And we used to, people used to joke that that's why they kill all the poets, because they want to be the only people around. Um, and, and books, for example, I, this has happened to many authors, that sometimes you will be asked to donate a book to a prison, and the book will come back, and there will be a form, and the warden will have outlined, this book is, it's got certain type of language, and, and usually it's revolutionary language, language that 
that acknowledges, even by refusing this book, that once someone is able to read, once their, their mind is able to escape where they are, uh, then they are they are outside a kind of um, prison. So Camus said that the artist is groping its way in the dark, incapable of separating himself from the world's misfortune while longing for solitude and silence, dreaming of justice, yet being himself a source of injustice, dragged even though he thinks he is driving behind a chariot that is bigger than he. So this chariot, the chariot of injustice, is bigger than all of us, but we can pull it together. We can move it collectively if we can find a place to stand, if we can find a place for each other, and if we can stand by one another, if we become each other's um, level. So create dangerously for people who read dangerously. This is what I've always thought it's meant to be. It meant to be a writer. Writing, knowing in part that somewhere, someone might one day risk his life to read you. And reading and writing is not only solitary, but it's a solidary act. And when you read and share the work of a writer who is otherwise censored, otherwise brutalized, otherwise silent, you make their lives and their work worthwhile. Even if they're long gone and gave the lives for that work, like as many of uh, Haitian artists did, you keep that life, that work alive through your communion with um, that work. Now there's a very sensitive line here, and it's one I think we all have to decide for ourselves. Should we uh, criminalize even speech that offends us? And are writers still allowed to create deplorably, to say things um, that offend us? Um, I certainly would argue that we can engage and push back and not be silenced and, and question, just like that young man questioned who brought it to his mother's attention, that textbook in Texas, in Texas but we cannot uh, respond, uh, we cannot silence uh, people. Um, recently, uh, my friend Juno Diaz and I, uh, Juno Diaz who wrote Drown and other books went, um, we accompanied a, a group of uh, Dominicans of Haitian descent who were about to, uh, to went to speak before Congress. And um, soon after we came back, Juno got a lot of um, backlash, including a, a, a prize that he had been given by the consul in New York. He was. Uh, called anti-Dominican, and so here, here was an example of an artist taking a position who received government uh, censure, and this, and this happened um, last week. That kept, that also reminded us of the importance, um, of, the importance of, our, of our voice. So to create dangerously and to, is to try and remake a world, even if that world is full of xenophobia, racism, and just plain um, mean, meanness. And yes, um, the artist who, create who creates dangerously can never fully uh, be a bystander. So though we are not creating as dangerously as our forebears, though we are not risking their kind of suffering and execution through torture, beating, execution, though exile does not threaten us into ex perpetual silence, though we become becoming social pariahs for saying the wrong thing or being derided, or trolled on social media might be our greatest fear, or even getting it wrong, you still need some level of courage to put yourself out in the Colosseum at all, even as a simple witness or a person um, with sight. So I will um, close by making a more sentimental argument of what um, ways that we also um, can create dangerously. And it involves a very old fashioned, the very old fashioned notion of love. Um, recently, my, my daughter started uh, studying Archimedes, which is the, 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 the Greek uh, mathematician who said Eureka, who first came up with that, with that term when he realized that certain things flowed in water a certain um, way. And one of the things that he is said to have said, aside from Eureka, is that love is a theorem, like any math mathematical theorem, that needs to be proved every day. So I would like to make the case that love is also one of the many levers that would move up the earth. Love, innovation, emotion, courage, transcendence, all of which are at the heart of art. Love might even give us the courage to be dangerous enough to try and change the world. 
love as the enemy of fear of silence, of fear and silence, I propose is a revolutionary um, act. And even James Baldwin um, would talk a lot about his book, The Fire Next Time, is often quoted as, as a revolutionary text. But then he also talks about love um, in The Fire Next Time. And he says, love takes off the mask that we fear we cannot live without and know that we can not live within. I use the love word, he says, not merely in the personal sense, but as a state of being and as a state of grace. So I propose to you that love as a state of grace is the enemy of fear. And I will close by reading to you um, a piece from Brother I'm Dying. Um, Brother I'm Dying is um, a memoir of love, and it's a book that I wrote in 2004 when my, uh, there was uh, an, an uprising in Haiti and my uncle uh, was caught up in it and, and um, was coming to Miami and was detained by immigration and died in immigration custody. And my father was very sick and died that same year. And my daughter was born that same year. And it was uh, the full cycle of life and love and creation and everything that there are moments, um, just as uh, Camille said, there are two or three moments in everybody's life where your heart, heart first opened. That was my most recent, where my heart just burst. And, and I suddenly understood all the things that I was told about creation, about art, about memory. And it's embodied um, in this little folktale that I will um, close with before I take your questions. It is not our way to let our grief silence us. Grandma Melina once told a story about a daughter whose father had died. The daughter loved her father so much that her heart was shattered into a hundred pieces. When it came time to plan for the jubilant country wake, which was once held the night before all funerals, the daughter wanted no part of it and ordered that it not be held. Tifi, daughter, said one of the wise old women in the daughter's village, please let the people rejoice at your father's wake tonight before they cry at his funeral tomorrow. There will be no rejoicing, answered the daughter. Why should I ever rejoice again when my father is dead? Tiffy, daughter, insisted the old woman, please let the wake be held. Your father is now in a land beneath the waters. It is not our way to let anything silence us. Knowing that the old woman had the gift that the ancestors grant to only a chosen few of being able to journey between the living and the dead, the daughter said to the old woman, I will allow the wake to be held only if you go to the land beneath the waters and bring my father back. The old woman walked to the nearest river and slipped into the waters. And a few hours later, she reemerged and walked straight to the daughter's house. Where's my father? asked the daughter. Tifi, said the old woman. I am back from beneath the waters, deep into the bowels of the earth. There were some wide and narrow roads, and I took them. There were many hills and mountains, and I climbed them. There were hamlets and villages, towns and cities, and I passed through them too. And I finally reached the land of the ancestors, the city of the dead. Did you see my father? Asked the daughter impatiently. I saw so many people there, I couldn't even tell you, answered the old woman. All my loved ones who died were there. But did you see my father? Shouted the daughter. Tifi, daughter, answered the old woman. I looked and I looked amongst all those people until I found your father. Where is he? asked the daughter. I've come to take you back to the land of the living, I told your father. Your daughter's heart has been broken into a hundred pieces and she says she cannot live without you. What did he say to that? asked the daughter. 
I am so touched that my daughter wants me to come back, he said. But my home is now here in the land of the ancestors. Tell my daughter for me that les moun vivant, moun vivant, les moun mouri, moun mouri. When one is alive, one is alive. But when one is dead, one is dead. The old woman then pulled from her pocket a set of false teeth that the father had religiously worn in his mouth when he was still among the living and had taken with him into the land of the dead. Your father sent you this, said the old woman, so now you might believe that I saw him and accept what he says. The daughter took the teeth in her hand and looked at them with great sadness, but also with a new sense of courage. As my father wishes, so it shall be, she said. We will have the wake, a celebration, a remembrance to honor him. We will rejoice and celebrate his life before he is put in the ground. We will eat, but most importantly, we will tell our stories, for it is not our way to let anything, anything silence us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, we'll take questions now, and if you'll give me a second, I can get the mic over to you. Questions? It's dark in the house, so I can't really see. <laughs> Let's see, I'm going to come this way. We'll just have to start speaking. Oh, yeah. okay. let there be light. <laughs> So you mentioned the idea of uh, death and rebirth and so on and how that was in uh, your personal life, but also having read uh, the first part of Clear of the Sea Light, we see it reappears. And I'm wondering to what extent uh, that topic intrigue you, intrigues you, but also to what extent you put your life in your fiction. Um, well, thank you for being brave enough to be first. <laughs> Uh, Claire of the Sea Light, for those of you who haven't read it, it's a, it's a novel in stories about a little girl whose um, mother uh, passes away. I'm not giving anything away. That's the, that's the first line. Um, and her dad is trying to figure out whether to stay, keep her with him or give her away to this uh, rich woman in town. Um, so the, certainly in Claire of the Sea Light, there is uh, a lot to that cycle uh, as happened for me, uh, my, my father died really a month after my daughter was born and the whole time he was sick for a long time and he kept, you know, he kept saying, I want to see the firstborn of my firstborn and, and we really think that, that uh, he stayed alive for that. And, and so a lot of my, I, I feel like my own emotional autobiography is in the books that I write. It's not necessarily strictly autobiography, the characters are not me, I'm not them, but it's coming from the source, it's coming from, from what I've lived, from what I've observed, so I, I do put a lot of sort of my emotional um, stuff in the fiction, and, and I do borrow from the lives of people I know, so watch out, don't make yourself too memorable. <laughs> um, because it's, it's I, I think we, we're all working, it's, it's, it's like, like Camus says, there are all these, you know, certain, experiences that mark us very much. And if you're, if you're an artist, it inevitably will manifest in the work that you do because that's also another outlet for it. So I, I mean, sometimes it's, it's, it's said to young writers that it's sort of, oh, you just, you're exploiting your life. But I think that's what everybody who writes does. Even if you do something completely different to avoid exploiting your life, you're still reacting to um, events in your life to produce the work that you're producing. <laughs> uh, 
Hi. Um, first of all, I would like to thank you for being here because to me it's, it's truly an honor. I've been telling my colleagues that I'm going to try not to be all fangirl on you um, because I really love your work. I've read every single one of your books. Um, so as the avid reader that I am, uh, one of the things that I admire about your work and that is the topic of your lecture tonight is the idea of the artist and especially the immigrant artist to um, to be responsible for cre creating dangerously. And that's something that, for example, uh, captivated me when you wrote about the 1937 massacre of Haitians in the Dominican Republic uh, that was part of the, the story behind uh, the farming of bones. Um, there's another uh, very interesting topic that seems to emerge here and there in some of your works, um, from Breath Eyes Memory to um, Claire of the Sea Light, and that is the issue of the Restavec system that exists in Haiti. So I was wondering if you're, if you have any plans on writing more directly about it, because right now it's only been mentioned kind of sideways and never been truly at the core of the narrative. And I would love to read what you have to say about it. Well, the, um, the, the you know, recently there was a study about uh, sort of a ranking of of places where children are in situations that are very close to en enslavement, and, and 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 unfortunately Haiti was pretty high on the on the ranking. It's it's a uh, the the Savek system is um, and it's it's more it's a very very sad and unfortunate practice in which children um, or families who cannot take care of their children might then. Um, offer them to another family, and those children become, in many instances, work. They work in the house, and, and often the, the there's an appeal to the family that will give your will make your child go to school, and, and the child ends up being in servitude or you know in someone in someone's house. Um, I haven't, you know, I, I think in, in Claire of the Sea Light, it's suddenly it's it's the shadow situation where the father is very worried that if something happens to him, that that will happen to his daughter. Um, I haven't written about it directly, as you mentioned, but there are some, there's a wonderful um, book called Ristavec by a, a, a man who um, was in, you know, in the Ristavec system and because his father passed away and basically, uh, his father traveled and left him with, with the woman he was involved with and this man became a, a child servant and he grew up and escaped the system and wrote a, a very interesting and powerful memoir um, about it, and he started a foundation, and, and there are a lot of people who work, who've worked over the years to try to um, wipe that out. And it's, um, I, I think the one of the ways that it it can be eradicated is through, uh, along with the eradication of poverty, because um, when when people have uh, diff are in a very difficult economic situation, and some they're offered the illusion that their child will have a better life, they are definitely tempted to to turn their, their child over to that system. There's been a lot of awareness campaigns in Haiti, but I think as long as you don't have the uh, economic impetus where you people have, you know, you, there are ways to keep their children with them because it's not that they don't love their children. Um, I worked I worked on a, uh, on a film called Girl Rising um, about um, girls around the different parts of the world. And, and, and I, watching that film, I was really shocked that there are many places in the world, you know, in the research leading up to it, to that, where this happens to girls and boys, uh, because for the same reasons, because the parents aren't able to, to support them. Hi. Um, so in your works, you create really, really vibrant characters, and um, I'm wondering uh, what your process is of meditating on the creation of those characters. And then the uh, second part of my question is, um, after you've written the book, do they stay with you in some kind of way? Because I know um, that they stayed with me um, after I finished the last page. Well, thank you for that. I mean, characters, I mean, my probably my approach to creating characters is like they're people to me. Um, so they're not, they, they exist. And every once in a while, you know, my, my first book, uh, Breath Eyes Memory, the mother has a, there's a baby in there. 
And I, sometimes I said, I wonder what's happening with Bridget. I wonder if she's in college. <laughs> um, how, you know, and you, you do wonder. I love, in, in The Color Purple, Alice Walker at the end has this, she has her acknowledgments and she thanks the characters for coming. And, and so I think of them as people. Um, and I think of them as like people as anyone I know. And I was saying this earlier to a, a group of, of, of students is that I, I think characters, they're characters who come to you just like when you meet certain people and you feel like, oh, I've known you, you know, all my life, you know. And, um, and, and I remember I, I said this one to my husband when I was in love. I said, oh, I said, oh, I, I wish I'd known you when I was five. He's like, well, we probably wouldn't be married. <laughs> If we've known each other that long. But there are characters that are like that. You feel like, oh, I, you know, you meet one person and you're like, that's my friend forever. Or we just haven't met yet. And, and then other people that it takes you a while to draw out. And then you have to go through all these mechanics with characters like that, where you have to try to get pictures from magazines to give them a face. But it all depends. And, but my, but I, I think of them as, I immediately think of them as people. And even the ones who are awful, you know, even the torturers and, um, I, you try not to make up stick figures, but because everybody's complex and nuanced, and and um, so for my character, for example, the dew breaker who was uh, the torturer in the daytime, and and I tried to think of good things about him because somewhere there's a person who loves him, he has family, and to try to really think of even the worst characters, balancing um, just as you know, make them as complex as actual people. Maybe one last question. Um, good afternoon, or yeah. good night. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, your storytelling is really second to none. Your ability to kind of give hints in the beginning of your books and then clarify throughout the remaining of your chapters is something that really stands out to me. And I was just wondering what influences you whenever you come up with little stories, with, with your stories and just some of your influences for writing style. Well, uh, that's what, one of the reasons I wanted to read that, that last section as, as part of the talk um, was because really for me, again, back to sort of one of those things where your heart first opened number one would be storytelling, would be the stories that I was told when I was younger. And I never, like the story I read, I never quite understood what they meant until I was living through sort of similar life circumstances, until I was that daughter whose father died. And, and so for me, that's the first, I always tell people when I ask who are my best writing teachers are the storytellers of my childhood who told me those types of stories, like, like that piece that I read. So that's certainly my, big influence. And I know, you know, being in this state too, it reminds me of my other, what my other big uh, storytelling influence is Maya Angelou. Um, when I was, uh, when I just came to this country and I was learning English, I read um, I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings with a Dictionary. And I couldn't believe, like it was, even though it was a different country, it was in a state that I knew anything about, you know, I was, I had just come from Haiti, I was a, a, a girl, and I read that and I thought, oh my, that sounds like, that sounds like the province in Haiti and the grandma sounds like my grandma. And um, so storytellers like that who kind of weave um, the setting, history, and their own personal experiences, who are also brave. I think um, when I first read, I, I feel like having read I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings gave me permission to write Breath Eyes Memory, which has also some very, um, sort of challenging uh, material in it, you know, emotionally. But I thought, if she could do that, if she could tell that story, and it's true, you know, and it's her story, and it's her life, and, and that was also very dangerous, because certain stories it can make you a pariah within your own family, within your own community. And if you become worried about what people look at you, and, and, and they know your whole past when they're looking at you, so definitely the oral storytelling and then these writers like Maya Angelou, like Toni Morrison, like James Baldwin, and these writers who, who took on personal experience and really retold it to us in a way that their story became our story. And that was always um, my goal as a writer, as I was, even as I was a baby writer learning, is to sort of find that place where um, 
where the reader and I meet, sort of that middle space where we come together, which is, which is wonderful in places like this because you can never predict the face of the reader. I certainly couldn't have predicted that I would be in Hendrix, <laughs> that I would be here um, when I was writing any of those books, especially when I was writing the, my little stories when I was your age. So um, it's, it's been a wonderful um, honor and I'm, I'm very grateful that you came tonight to, to, to listen. Thank you. Thank you.